From the first days of creation, when man gazed high into the heavens and saw the clouds drifting majestically toward an unknown horizon and watched the birds soar gracefully across pristine skies, he dreamed of knowing for himself the joys and mysteries that lay above the confines of his earth. At first, the dreamers of our world could only create myths to carry themselves aloft. Daedalus and Icarus with their wings of feathers and wax, and Elijah rising into heaven on a whirlwind of fiery horses. As long as there have been human beings, the sky has been the domain of the divine. It represents freedom and power and control and the ability to leave earthly cares and woes behind. So I think all of that is uh, wound up in our, our desire to, to fly, to leave the earth and taste the freedom of the birds. For some, myths and legends were not enough to satisfy their spirit of adventure. They demanded more than just imagining the exhilaration of soaring on the wings of the wind. They wanted to feel the freedom of flying alongside the clouds and know the joy of climbing up into an unknown world of sunlight and solitude. I go up there to see beauty and to perfect the skill. So my challenge, I guess, is to find an eagle and manage to fly up to him gently enough not to spook him. And then fly with him for a while. For me, it's more discovery than challenge. It's more an exploration. Oh, the dream of flight goes all the way back to the Greeks and Icarus and uh, his uh, wings with wax and flying too close to the sun. Um, man's dreams of flying went on to the great inventors of the Middle Ages who drew sketches of flying machines which didn't work. But that dream of flight, the, the dream of going beyond uh, our current environment, uh, beyond our current reach, I think is a continuing thing for mankind. For the early dreamers, successful journeys above the earth could only be found in the imagination. The designs of their flying machines were based more on faith and fantasy than on science. But in the 15th century, the great artist and inventor Leonardo da Vinci began to temper imagination with scientific principles. His notebooks revealed detailed drawings of mechanical wings and flapping wing flying machines. Also among his papers were drawings of a parachute and a helicopter. In the centuries following da Vinci's first musings about the possibility of flight, the age-old dream continued to haunt the adventurous of spirit. Some envisioned devices that would float like the clouds in the wind because they could be made lighter than the air around them. Others saw heavier-than-air machines that would soar with the wings of birds above the fields and forests of the earth. 200 years after da Vinci, the Jesuit priest Francesco Delana designed an aerial boat with a sail lifted by four thin evacuated copper spheres. Delana's attempt at a lighter-than-air vessel was impractical, yet he brought the dream of flight another step closer to the realm of science. In the early 1780s in Avignon, France, a papermaker named Joseph Montgolfier wondered if it was possible to harness the force that lifted smoke and ashes up the chimney and put it to work lifting objects into the air. He built his fire and placed a bag of fine silk over it. And what happened that day in November 1782 would change the dream of flight forever. 
In 1783, Montgolfier and his brother Etienne demonstrated their aerostatic machine at Versailles before the French court of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. The brothers sent aloft a sheep, a rooster, and a duck as their first balloon passengers. It was only a matter of time before the first human passenger would experience balloon flight. And that honor went to Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier. On October 15, 1783, he remained aloft in a tethered balloon for nearly four and a half minutes. Then, on November 21st of that same year, de Rosier and the Marquis d'Arlande made the first free flight. The great age of ballooning had begun, and mankind had fulfilled his dream of floating alongside the clouds. There's, there's probably no other form of aviation where you have is complete control and contact with the environment that you're flying, and if you fly through a cloud, it's in the basket with you. It's, it's, it's just a very simple, pure way of, of flying. It's like having an infatuation when you're up here, and, and everything is just lighter and brighter and cleaner and bluer, uh, and, and the romance just stays uh, with, with the balloon flights uh, the whole way through, no matter how long you do it. In the early days, the sight of a balloon ghosting above the countryside was a phenomenon so astounding that some pioneer balloon pilots carried bottles of wine with them to prove upon landing that they were from this earth and not from some alien world. From the last decades of the 18th century into the first half of the 19th, ballooning spread throughout the world. But there were a growing number of dreamers who were not satisfied to be at the whim of the wind. They continued to puzzle over the possibility of heavier-than-air flight. They yearned not only to rise above the earth like the balloonists, but to soar through the skies and control their graceful motion in much the same way that birds control their flight. Human beings could have flown a very long time before they in fact did. The materials, you know, the, the kinds of woods that you need were available to the ancient Egyptians um, or the Inca. What was missing was the, the sort of mindset, um, the way in which to put those materials together in a flying machine. The, the natural way to want to fly was like a bird with flapping wings. And uh, that's just not a very efficient or effective way to do it. So it wasn't until the 19th century, really, that the notion of the fixed wing was established with separate control systems and propulsion systems and so on. And that's where it really begins, the, the drive to fly um, in, in the early years of the 19th century with men like Sir George Cayley. Between the years 1796 and 1853, English baronet Sir George Cayley created a number of models and gliders that preceded the airplane as we know it today. He also built and tested the world's first full-size glider. One of his more famous machines was first manned by his coachman. When it came to rest rather roughly on his Yorkshire lawn, the coachman complained I was hired to drive, not to fly. He promptly gave notice, never to work or fly for Sir George again. In 1842, William Henson and John Stringfellow designed and patented their aerial steam carriage. But like so many others before it, their design remained merely another unproven concept. In 1875, Thomas Moy did actually build his aerial steamer, a machine that is said to have lifted itself off the ground and into the air for a few seconds. But this was still not flight. In 1889, the German engineer Otto Lilienthal published his renowned book, Bird Flight as the Basis for Aviation. 
After carefully studying the principles of bird flight, Lilienthal combined that knowledge with what he had learned from his aerodynamic experiments and began a thorough and systematic program of flight tests with full-size gliders. By 1896, Lilienthal had made more than 2,000 gliding flights. The exploits and fame of what some called the first great glider pilot spread throughout the world, influencing such aviation pioneers as Octave Chanute and the Wright brothers. As he once wrote, Lilienthal was convinced that to succeed as a pilot, an airman must get on intimate terms with the wind. The glider is, is the purest, simplest, most unadulterated form of flying because just to take the glider down the ridge, tucking in and out of the rocks, just because it feels good. The kinetic sensation, the g-force, the sound of the wind changing, the uh, horizon banking, the, the rocks coming in close and then swinging out wide. There's an artistry to it. Um, there, are, there are people who fly, there are pilots, and then there are people who fly who are artists. Lilienthal's graceful and elegant gliders were created from willow and cloth. He also built two experimental powered aircraft, but he didn't live to test his newest creations. On Sunday, August 9, 1896, his glider stalled, crashed, and he died from his injuries. His final words were these, sacrifices must be made. In 1890, Frenchman Clement Adet's monoplane, Aeole, recorded a 165-foot hop. Adet achieved an altitude of eight inches, yet this was still neither controlled nor sustained flight. In 1894, Sir Hiram Maxim built a huge biplane which was powered by two 180-horsepower steam engines. It was said to have lifted itself and its crew a weight of over 8,000 pounds into the air. Although tethered and not controlled or sustained flight, it could have been considered a momentary victory over gravity. By the turn of the 19th century, the dreamers had finally arrived at that moment in history when they literally teetered on the very edge of powered flight. It had become a race to determine who would be the first to achieve sustained, controlled flight and venture into the realm of the eagle and hawk under their own power. In 1903, one of America's preeminent scientists, Samuel Pierpoint Langley, prepared to launch his great aerodrome from a houseboat on the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. The aircraft had a wingspan of 48 feet and was powered by a 52.4 horsepower radial engine. The pilot was Langley's assistant, Charles Manley. After starting the engine, the cable securing the launch catapult was cut. Suddenly, there was a roaring, grinding noise and a disheartened Langley watched as his airship disappeared into the river below, and his attempt to become the first to fly failed. As history has shown, that honor would ultimately belong to a pair of talented yet relatively unknown bicycle builders, Wilbur and Orville Wright. They became interested in flight for the first time between 1896 and 1899. And they did a lot of reading and a lot of thinking. They came up with an approach to the control problem that worked. And so they forged ahead and built two gliders, one in 1900 and the one in 1901. Neither of them worked um, the way in which they were predicted to work on, on paper. So the Wright brothers, rather than giving up, uh, went back to ground research. The Wrights approached the problem of manned mechanical flight differently than most of the others of their age. Their focus was not just on designing a machine that would rise into the air, but on controlling it once aloft. My observation of the flights of buzzards leads me to believe that they retain their lateral balance when partly overturned by a gust of wind by a torsion of the tips of their wings. 
It was December 17, 1903, at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Bitter cold. A 27-mile-an-hour wind is blowing across the hills from the north. At 10 o'clock in the morning, Wilbur and Orville decide to make the first of what would be four attempts. At 10.30, they start the engine. The brothers shake hands, and Orville assumes his position as pilot. At 10.35, Orville releases the tether, and the aircraft begins to move into the winds. Wilbur ran at the side of the machine, holding the wing to balance it on the track. He was able to stay with it until it lifted from the track after a 40-foot run. The course of the flight up and down was exceedingly erratic. A little over 120 feet from the point where it rose into the air, the flight ended. Their first flight lasted 12 seconds. After two more successful tries, the Wrights prepared for their fourth and final flight of the day. With Wilbur at the controls, the airplane stayed airborne for 59 seconds and covered a distance of 852 feet, almost eight times as far as their initial attempt. For the first time in history, a machine carrying a man had lifted itself into the air by its own power and achieved controlled, sustained flight. What set Wilbur and Orville right apart from everyone else who had really tried to do this thing before. They were men who were very sure of themselves. Once they were convinced uh, that they were correct about something, it really didn't matter very much to them what anyone else thought. Uh, they had a lot of confidence in their own ability and, and in the answers that uh, grew out of their, their own research. Another thing that set the Wright brothers apart was the fact that they had this really incredible ability to sort of image machines in their head, um, to imagine what a machine that had yet to be built might look like and how it might behave when certain forces were acting on it. Uh, but there are also there's those personal qualities that they had, uh, their perseverance and determination and their refusal to be stymied by a problem. Uh, their ability, sort of clarity of mind, their ability to just cut through um, a lot of useless stuff to the heart of the problem. All of those kinds of things really work together to, to set them apart from the others. Since much of the Wright brothers' work was not reported in detail by a skeptical American press, weary of false first flight claims, news of the Wright's achievements reaching Europe was vague and oftentimes incomplete. On October 23, 1906, at Bagatelle, France, the Brazilian Santos Dumont piloted his 14 Biz aircraft for an official distance of 60 meters. The dapper little Brazilian was hailed as conqueror of the air, the first man to fly. Only later would Santos Dumont learn that he had been preempted by the Wright brothers three years earlier. By the time of Santos Dumont's flight, the Wright brothers were making routine flights. The Wright Flyer was the world's first truly practical aircraft and could remain airborne under full control as long as the fuel supply lasted. The decade between 1906 and 1916 was a period of extraordinary progress in the art and science of aviation. In a six-month period from August 1908 to January 1909, Wilbur Wright made over 100 flights, establishing three world records. Longest flight, slightly more than two hours, 20 minutes. Longest flight carrying a passenger and a record altitude of 377 feet but records weren't the only new landmarks being established by the former bicycle builders. The Wright military flyer that flew in 1909 was the first airplane ever owned by a government and the first military airplane, and it certainly was a, it was a real airplane. It, it, it took off, it flew 30, 40 minutes, circled around, could navigate and so on.
In 1908, American Glenn Curtis, a mechanic and former motorcycle racer, was making his debut as an aviator. At first, his flying machines were financed from contributions to the Aerial Experiment Association by the wife of another well-known dreamer, Alexander Graham Bell. The first aviators, they were, they were all kinds of people. They were people like Glenn Curtis, who uh, right on the coattails of the Wright brothers, really, and building, designing here. Of course, Glenn Curtis held the world speed record in motorcycle driving, and just knew engines and made engines perform, and then, of course, could make airplanes perform. He couldn't wait to get into flying, and he made a famous flight, which allowed him to continue in his business, a flight from Albany to New York, and he picked up, I think it was $10,000 for that flight. On July 25th, 1909, another aviation pioneer, Louis Blériot, rose before dawn, climbed into his Blériot 11 monoplane, and set out from Calais toward the White Cliffs of Dover. 37 minutes later, the Frenchman performed one of his customary crash landings, but he had conquered the English Channel and won Lord Heathcliff's 1,000 pound prize as the first to do so. A month later, in Ram, France, there was a gathering that brought together many of the world's leading pilots to compete in the first Gordon Bennett Cup races. More than 200,000 paid admission to attend the Ram flying meeting, and 100,000 more watched the flights from the nearby hills. They came to see the daring of such aviators as eventual race winner Glenn Curtis, along with Blerio, Farman, Latham, and the other heroes of this new age of aviation. We're just coming out of the horse and buggy era. And uh, I think there was a, a general distrust for anything that operated off the ground. I mean, people didn't even trust an automobile at the time. I mean, uh, around the flying fields in some of the uh, old books, you'll see pictures of pilots uh, riding horseback or horse and buggy to the airplane and then hopping in an airplane. My father delivered mail in a horse and buggy, and he lived to see Sputnik. What a sensational time to be on the face of the earth. Wherever the airmen went, they drew enormous crowds. There was a global fascination with the idea of flight. A crowd of a million or more watched Wilbur Wright fly above Manhattan and around the Statue of Liberty in 1909. Watch one of the earliest dramatic moments ever filmed. It's 1910. Even former President Teddy Roosevelt couldn't resist the lure of the skies as he climbed aboard a Wright Flyer biplane to experience the thrill of first-time flight for himself. As the Wright biplane touches down three minutes and 20 seconds later, the famed leader of the Rough Riders, prototype of American daring and decision, has given tremendous cheer from the crowd for a successful adventure. For many pioneer aviators, flight itself was no longer enough. Nothing less than mastery would do. Each flight became a quest to go beyond the next horizon. Each new pilot dreamed of flying higher and faster than ever before, of moving for the first time through another one of nature's ancient barriers. Tremendous cheers greeted announcements after the trial you are seeing. Ablerio did a mile and 53 seconds. Here is the first stunt flyer of all time. It's Ralph Johnstone and his 24-horsepowered Wright biplane. Seen here in 1910, just before he set new altitude record of 9,741 feet. More and more people were taking to the skies. So many that, in 1910, the New York world assigned a reporter full-time to the aviation beat. A number of the early aviators began to take on students who were anxious to venture up into this new world high above the earth. I got interested in flying at the age of four and a half when, uh, in 1910 when uh, 
Glenn Curtis flew, first flew down the Hudson River in his uh, little biplane, uh, which was built like a kite out of uh, bamboo. And he landed to refuel in a field across the road from my father's farm. And that's the day that I lost interest in steam locomotives and decided that I wanted to be a pilot. Most airplanes couldn't take two people. So there was actually a flight instructor at a school who wasn't a flyer, but he rode along on a motorcycle hollering to the guys as they went down the runway what to do, how to fly the airplane. It was a case of flying from one side of the field to the other. But then when you got good, you would leave the field and you might go cross country. And there were actual cases where a pilot would leave the field and fly in a straight line and maybe go a mile or 10 miles and he didn't seem to be able to feel comfortable to turn. So we'd land in a field, turn the airplane around and point it in the other direction, home, take off again and fly home. That has actually happened. The growing roster of new pilots included a significant number of women. Ruth Law, Melly Bisi, Hildy Hewlett, Catherine Stinson, Harriet Quimby, and Matilda Morsant. I think women realized when aviation was created or invented that they needed to get in on the ground floor of aviation so that they wouldn't be left out like they were left out of everything that the men controlled. And they thought if they got in in the beginning, then that women would be accepted as having been in aviation from the very beginning. Throughout America, people were turning out by the thousands to see demonstrations of flight. One of the most flamboyant exhibition pilots ever to capture the minds and imaginations of the public was Lincoln Beachy. It's been said that he looped his airplane 1,000 times in front of 17 million people in 126 cities during his career. Among the most popular features of his performance was a race between his airplane and such famous automobile racers as Eddie Rickenbacker and Barney Oldfield. Rarely did exhibition flyers of the pre-war era live long enough to retire and enjoy their fame. They loved to fly, the danger be damned. By 1915, many of the early heroes of flight had fatally crashed, including Lincoln Beachy, and Harriet Quimby. While performing at an exhibition in Boston, the passenger in her Blario leaned too far forward, causing the plane to nose over. As her passenger fell from the airplane, the Blario flipped over, throwing Miss Quimby to the ground. And one of America's most glamorous aviators, the first woman to cross the English Channel, would never again venture into the skies above the earth. The spirit of those early exhibition pilots, that desire to share the thrills and excitement of flight with people all across the country, is still alive and well. The aircraft of today's airshow pilots may be at the cutting edge of modern technology, but their love of flying is the same as it was for those who came before them. I, I'm not really happy unless I'm around airplanes. I've tried it. I, I don't really like it. It seems like I get a little, I don't know, I get a little bummed sometimes in the winter, and as soon as I get back to my airplane, everything's okay again. Everything's great. So. I consider myself a, a precision aerobatic pilot. Some people call us, uh, some people call us stunt pilots, but uh, stunt is something that you do one time. We're precision aerobatic pilots. It's just nonstop, hardcore, kick-ass aerobatics. myself a barnstormer, a stunt pilot, a daredevil, whatever they want to think about me, because 
I was put, put on this earth is to fly through the sky and share my dreams and my magic. I was born to be an air show pilot. The centuries-old dream had now become a reality, and the machines that just a few short years before had existed only in the minds of the dreamers were already being replaced by newer and better planes, aircraft that would take man higher into the heavens than he had ever gone before. But the memories of those early flying machines has not been lost with the passage of time. Today, there are still havens for these beautiful machines of aviation's first years, and for the men and women who fly them and keep them alive. What do you think about this one, Jim, down here? Oh, we gotta get that one. Old airplanes combine so many great things. They combine nostalgia, freedom, uh, adventure, man against the elements. You're out there, you're fighting with your engine and your airplane in the wind currents, and you've got a beautiful airplane with wire wheels and an old engine, and, uh, canvas and fabric that you built yourself. It's, uh, it's just an amazing combination of things. These airplanes were made out of materials that were once alive, the wooden trees and the, the uh, fabric of the airplane uh, is made from materials that were once living, linen and cotton and so on. So again, to me as an artist, uh, it's kind of part of a living thing here that you're part of, not just some plastic and steel conglomeration which you have no relationship with. This aircraft uh, is a Hanrio, a 1910 Hanrio, it's a replica. The fuselage here looks like a racing shell, very lightweight, very strong. The wings are like a Blario. They warp with this control here, and that's how you keep the wings level. This control stick here moves the elevators, controls how whether the nose goes up or down. This was the latest equipment for these pilots back then. You know, they didn't go through all the testing that you see today. They got in it and they flew it, and if it flew great, Good. they liked it, and then they took it. You ready to go? Contact. Contact. In the early days, in my hometown, there was an airport, uh, and watching some of the pilots in the airplanes, you realize that the pilots were madmen, but the airplanes were beautiful, and to see them in flight, uh, even more beautiful than sitting on the ground. And, the pilots were madmen, but the planes were beautiful. So it must have seemed to those who saw the early pilots weaving their spell in the wind. Eccentric dreamers and daredevil scientists, people from all walks of life who were convinced that mankind was meant to fly. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I when President Woodrow Wilson declared that the world must be made safe for democracy. The year before the president's historic announcement, a small group of American aviators had volunteered to go to France as members of the Lafayette Escadrille Aerial Observation Squadron. It would be two years later, in May of 1918, before American military pilots and airplanes joined the aerial war high above the French countryside. They had 18, 19, 20-year-old pilots flying these airplanes, and uh, from the accounts that I've read, they were very cocky with these airplanes. I mean, they were doing things with these airplanes that no way would I do it. But these are young guys, and they're keen to go. So they were keen to do things, but of course it's sobering when somebody gets hurt. So uh, if you could survive the first few flights, the first month or two especially, then you, had a, you were getting good with your airplane. You were getting experience, you were getting better, and you were learning fast, you had to, and you had a better chance of survival. Although reconnaissance remained the primary mission for pilots, both sides began to develop specialized aerial fighters 
that clashed in large numbers. Duels, man against man, machine against machine. The Albatross, Newport, Spad, Sopwith Camel. The names of these planes still have an almost heroic ring. During the First World War, uh, they were starting off with really uh, wooden wire kites uh, and developing to uh, an airplane like the Albatross, uh, where they were making gains in speed, uh, maneuverability, altitude uh, capabilities. Uh, with the Albatross, you really started to develop a, uh, a workable fighting airplane. Some of them were great. And some of them were bad. For instance, the great one, one of them, would be the Avro 504, a super plane. Anybody uh, with any kind of coordination or mechanical aptitude could learn to fly it, probably in like four hours. And they were learning it to fly it in four hours. It just, you give it the power and you know how to hold it straight, it just floats away. Progression then from the Avro 504 trainer to the Sopwith Camel, yowie, it's a whole different thing. It was very sensitive, super sensitive, performs great, wonderful airplane. But for the guy that's learned to fly and got four hours in an Avro 504 to jump into the cockpit of a Sopwith Camel, that is a big leap ahead. Flew a spot today. Easy to fly, but dangerous as hell just like flying the famous barn door Beachy used to talk about. And it has the gliding angle of a brick. I've always laughed at the regulars wearing spurs to fly in, but I needed a pair in this spot. It bucked just like a Bronco. The air war created legends, the great early aces of the skies, René Fonck of France, the Canadian Billy Bishop with his 72 aerial victories. The Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen of Germany. And the American aces, Raoul Lufberry and Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. It's 1918 and the roughneck from Columbus, Ohio has given up gold for glory. With fame as racing driver far behind him, Edward Vernon Rickenbacker is now in France as Captain Eddie in the 94th Air Squadron. An enlistee, he's made chauffeur to Billy Mitchell, famed aviator. But he talks Mitchell into letting him transfer to Air Corps. After 17 days of training, he's given commission, wings, and a new plane. Each side had its uh, uh, greats. Uh, the French had Charles Nungesser, um, known as the Iron Man. They had uh, Georges Guinemer. Uh, the Germans had von Richthofen, Udet, uh, Werner Voss, all well-known aviators, good pilots. Some were uh, good in a technical sense. Others, like von Richthofen, was a good hunter. He placed his emphasis on pursuing his opponent, whereas uh, other pilots may have stressed the technical capability of the airplane. When the survivors of the Great War came home, they brought their love of flying with them. It was in their blood. A country at peace had no need for warplanes, and the returning pilots could pick up a tired old DH-4 or Curtis Jenny for almost nothing. They simply painted out the military insignia on their planes, and they were in business, traveling around the country putting on exhibitions and selling rides for whatever the market would bear. It was a difficult and sometimes dangerous life. But we were flyers, said barnstormer Earl C. Reed, and that whole vast sky out there belonged to us alone, and that was enough. 
by the time I was uh, 17, I had studied uh, books on aviation uh, and engines and airplanes and flying uh, more than I studied my school lessons. And uh, I helped a barnstorming pilot all that summer selling tickets and working on his airplane. So at the end of the summer, the airplane, which was in atrocious condition, just unbelievably atrocious, he gave it to me. And I proceeded to teach myself to fly in that airplane. It was a, a World War I a Jenny, a Canadian Jenny. I wouldn't attempt it again. <laughs> it was a, teaching myself to fly was a rather risky proposition. But I did have a book, and I studied every word of that book and uh, practiced taxiing on the, on the airplane for about a month. And then I was able to get it just barely above the ground, crossing the field. And that taught me to keep the wings level. And finally, one day, I, I had to take off because I thought I was going to run into the wall at the other side of the field. So I took off. And I had quite a job getting that airplane down. I, I took me, I, 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 I suppose it took an hour and a half or two hours before I got it on the ground finally, after many attempts. But I didn't bust it. <laughs> they called themselves barnstormers, men and women who flew simply because they loved to fly. I would send out thousands of penny postcards in the farming country, and I would bring a huge crowd to some farm field, and I would carry passengers for a dollar a head. It was an unbelievably short ride. Uh, to make 250 to 350 flights in a day, the flights were only about 35 seconds. To take off and do a wing over and come back down, we're going to do another wing over and land and roll right up to the same spot. There was no taxiing involved, no loss of time. And I had a pit crew that could get uh, the passengers loaded and unloaded at the same time, out, out one side of the airplane and in the other, and away we'd go. And they didn't even have their, they didn't even have their down on their seats by that time. They were not even sitting down most of the time when we took off. And the, the ride was very brief, and actually I found that's what they wanted, a brief ride to see what it was like. And about, I would say, 25% of them went right back and bought more tickets to have another short ride. It was a real ro roller coaster ride. Yeah, the Barnstormers had the chance to bring aviation, even in its simplest form, to each and every little town. And so it forced the real American public to accept that airplanes are really a permanent thing. And this flying is not just a fad, and it's not just something that we're going to use in wartime, and that's it. It's May 15th, 1918, in the nation's capital, and the U.S. mail heads for its first trip by air. The load is 136 pounds, and its destination is the city of New York. President Wilson adds prestige and a letter to this historic event. Some of those wartime aviators, who weren't barnstorming across the country, found employment with the newly established U.S. Airmail Service when it began its flights in 1918. The first transcontinental run was made in 1924 when a military surplus DH-4 biplane carried the mail from New York to San Francisco. Flying at night and in all kinds of weather to stay on schedule, the early airmail service pilots paid a very heavy human toll. Of the 40 pilots originally hired by the United States Post Office, only nine were still alive by 1925. It's 1923 at the Dayton, Ohio airport. The crew of a tri-wing bombing bomber board giant airship in test flight of then biggest heavier than aircraft ever built. As aviation's second decade was drawing to a close, aircraft technology was reaching new heights of safety and reliability. In the 1920s, flight testing was being done to improve the performance of engines, airframes, and instruments. Among the most flamboyant of those early test pilots was one James Harold Jimmy Doolittle. 
Considered a daredevil by many, he was actually a highly professional pilot. At the Schneider International Seaplane Races in October of 1925, Doolittle flew his R3C2 float plane at speeds of up to 232 miles per hour, gaining another victory in record-setting time. This was just one of many world records that would be amassed by the daring young aviator. Jimmy Doolittle and this new generation of pilots would not be satisfied with mere flight. They were determined to take their new machines into the heart of the ancient mystery, to do what no man had ever done before. The uh, Fokker T2, which was flown, the first airplane to fly nonstop across the United States, uh, flew from uh, uh, Long Island to San Diego in 1923. Uh, two pilots in it, they flew for just a few minutes under 27 hours. But it was the first time the continent had ever been crossed nonstop. Uh, then the next year, in 1924, the Douglas World Cruiser that we have downstairs was one of two airplanes, four started out, two completed it, that flew around the world. It took just under six months to, uh, to uh, fly around the world with about 70 landings. But they did it. I mean, it was a tremendous logistics effort as well as a flying triumph. It's May 9, 1926. Navy Commander Richard Evelyn Byrd is about to join pilot Floyd Bennett on an historic journey. In their giant Fokker, they lift off from the icy waters of the Arctic for their first flight over the top of the world. Destination, North Pole and return. In 1926, just 17 years after Admiral Perry became the first person to reach the North Pole. Commander Richard Evelyn Byrd and pilot Floyd Bennett lifted their Fokker F7-3M off the ice and became the first men to fly over that northernmost point of the Earth. Mission is accomplished as Byrd and Bennett get more welcome But the triumphs of the skies were only just beginning. Soon, another young pilot would lift off into the heavens to begin a flight that would change the world forever. Few in history have captured the essential joy and mystery of flight better than Charles Lindbergh and his spirit of St. Louis. In symbolic terms, Lindbergh was sort of the 20th century equivalent of, of Daniel Boone. Technology was the great force of the 20th century. And here was this young, heroic, good-looking guy who used technology to go off and attack a new frontier. Strapped on his airplane and went off to conquer the, the sky, as it were. Da Vinci, Cayley, the Wright brothers, Charles Lindbergh, they may have lived in different centuries and used vastly different technologies, but they are bound together in a universal, timeless brotherhood. For in the world of dreams, lifting up in a Montgolfier balloon, or soaring off a mountaintop aboard a Lilienthal glider, is not that far removed from flying to the next meadow in a Hanrio, or crossing the Atlantic in the spirit of St. Louis. The dream is still the same a curious blend of mystery and joy, of danger and achievement, a reminder that from our first myths until our final voyage among the stars, the dream lives on, the dream endures.